Hey everybody, Misty Williams with Creative Entrepreneur Radio here, and I just finished an awesome interview with Sam Wagert, who is a young entrepreneur, 24 years old. He's been an entrepreneur for nine years, which is just remarkable. Um, he opened uh, his first martial arts school uh, when he was just 15 years old, and his story is just phenomenal. He's had amazing success as an entrepreneur that he credits to being surrounded by um, a lot of really great support, um, and it wasn't the support that you would expect. It wasn't necessarily his his family and you know people in his immediate um, circle lending support to him, but um, it's kind of like the universe just you know brought the people along that would um, boost him and um, and help him to achieve a, a a lot of success at a young age. So we have a fascinating conversation today. Um, we talk about some things that helped make him successful. And just some lessons that we're both learning as we're growing our business. And um, we get into the, this talk of masculine, feminine, and how that shows up in business and how we've used the masculine and feminine lens to um, lead better, to become better leaders, and to align with our, our staff and team and empower them in a more effective way. And, you know, we talk salsa dancing and of course, martial arts and, um, Alison Armstrong, he's a phenomenal teacher that we both really enjoy. And, um, we also talk a little bit about date with destiny, a signature event that, uh, Tony Robbins does that a lot of my entrepreneurial friends are a part of and, um, has made a significant difference in his life. So this conversation was just Phenomenal! I loved it. We were going to try to stick to 30 minutes and we just couldn't. It's a little bit longer, but I hope you enjoy it. Welcome to another episode of Creative Entrepreneur Radio. Welcome to Creative Entrepreneur Radio. We're going backstage to explore the lives, lifestyles, and growth strategies mastered by seasoned entrepreneurs around the world. Entrepreneurs are gladiators. Are you one of us? If you're a first-time listener, welcome. Feel free to add the podcast to your favorite RSS feed or iTunes and check out our show notes at creativeentrepreneurradio.com. Up now, host and founder of MarketTechU.com, Misty Williams. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Creative Entrepreneur Radio. Misty Williams here. And today, our special guest is Sam Wagert. Sam started his family-based business, Super Kicks in Amherst, Virginia, when he was 15 years old. As a homeschooled high schooler, he was exposed to entrepreneurial and leadership training as part of his education, and this inspired him to grow his school in Amherst to record, record numbers dis, despite a town population of only 1,500. He soon opened a second school in a hotel, and in only 12 months grew it to one of the most successful martial arts schools in the country. He became one of the youngest chief instructors in the United States, and he has a passion for teaching and inspiring others to reach their full potential. He has taught thousands of students in public and private schools across Virginia, and he recently opened Black Belt Leadership Schools in Charlotte, North Carolina and Charlottesville, Virginia. He loves the outdoors, including mountain biking, skiing, and backpacking, and he's an avid salsa dancer, which I can't wait for us to talk about <laughs> uh, during our interview today. Welcome to the show, Sam. Thank you so much. It's an honor and a privilege to be on. Thank you for this opportunity. Yeah, thank you for joining me. Well, I was actually introduced um, to you through a mutual friend of ours. And I have to say that the conversation that we had, just kind of getting to know you, I just felt like I could talk to you for days. You're such yes. a, yeah, you're an interesting person. And we've shared so many similar values and experiences. I'm super excited for everybody to get to know you a little bit. Um, during our interview and um, hopefully to connect with you over social and enjoy the great um, synergy that that I feel like I've uh, been able to enjoy from you. So I want to just dig in here because I think the thing that's probably most intriguing about your story is the fact that this all started for you when you were 15. I know, I know. And I, I have a, I want to say this as well. I just, uh, I think, you know, when you meet fellow entrepreneurs, there's always this, um, there's always some sort of a synergy that goes along with that. And I, I felt that in, when I first talked to you as well and your passion and enthusiasm for helping other entrepreneurs. So that came across even in our first conversation. So, awesome. Um, Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, yeah, 15 years old, I had a unique, I had a unique advantage uh, as in that I was homeschooled. So I'm not sure that that's a, a good fit or even a good age or a good number for everybody. However, for me, it was amazing 
simply because I, by the time I was 15, I was done with high school. I didn't have a lot of friends growing up, and um, it was it would just seemed like the right the right step for me to move into a business opportunity because it presented itself right there from the get go. So that was just a great opportunity for me to step into. Yeah. Well, Joe told me that you were young. He didn't give me a number. So <laughs> we, I, so I had that entire conversation with you, which was fabulous. And I'm thinking he was like 21, uh, 22, 20, maybe. <laughs> and then I was reading cause you, you know, mentioned a couple of resources. I was reading and I was like 15. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, stop the press. Right. I right. wasn't prepared for 15. Uh, so I have to say that like one of the things that I feel is becoming an advantage to me as I get older is that with age comes this sense of like confidence and certainty about who I am. And yes. it's really showing up in my business and the way yes. that I make decisions because in my own skin, I'm more certain. So yes. there must be something special in your skin for you oh. to have been at a place that young where you felt like you could make the hard and um, and uncertain decisions that you make as a business owner. So I'd love for you to kind of just like peel back the layers as best you can since you're in that body of yours and, um, and talk about what it was sure. like starting out and um, the kinds of things that you were confronted with early on to make sure that this venture was successful. Absolutely. And... I think you bring up a really interesting point in it, and that is how how do you as an entrepreneur and me as a 15 year old make some of the decisions that you have to make? And um, I am while I am flattered that you think it was something special that I uh, I had, I'm not sure I'm not sure if it if it was. I'll, I'll tell you the story about how it started. I um I had mentors from the very beginning, and I, it's funny you bring this up because just yesterday. I had a friend text me. He's also a fellow uh, Anthony Robbins fan and does a lot of personal development. And he asked me, and he's a couple years my senior, um, and I'm 24 now, so I think he's 26. And he's really trying to get his business off the ground. And he texted me and just said, you know, what's the, what's the secret? How do, I, how do I do it? And he's in that stage where he's having difficulty, like picking a direction and knowing what decisions to make. And the answer just immediately came to me on what to tell him simply because I knew what it was like for me at 15, 16, and 17. And the answer was simple. I said, you have to find somebody who has done what you want to do. Um, and then you simply have to learn their system. I think so often uh, people try to create initially without any sort of a, any sort of a mentor, anybody coaching them um, to, to get a result and they just, they're, they're overwhelmed by options, right? They say that there's, there's only two problems. They, they, there's either not enough options or there's too many options. <laughs> right. Too many options sometimes is a problem too. So I just had this, you know, at 15, I was, I had an opportunity. My martial arts instructor kind of came to me and said, look, I think you'd make a great instructor and I'd like to just take you under my wing and train you. And I, at that point I was only like 13. And so I was, enamored with this my martial arts instructor I love I loved him he was like a second dad to me and um, so he took me under his wing and he, he trained me and two years later when I was 15 he said I think you've got what it takes to run the school and I want to sell it to you and here's the system that you have to follow and it was just so easy for me to step into that role it wasn't because I really didn't have to even create anything at that age I was simply sticking to someone who had done it before with proven results. And it made that decision-making process very easy for me because there were, I guess, systems in place. There was a, there was a, a right way to do it you know, and a wrong way. And, and, and now that I've been in the business you know, for about nine years now, there's definitely some creativity that I add and I can expand upon that. But I only expanded upon it after I actually learned a system. Does that, does that yeah, make sense? Totally. So that was so helpful for me in making the decision. And then I would say one more thing, and that was having somebody to be able to call um, when situations arose. Like I'll never forget, I had a student one time. Uh, he was in the classroom, and he jumped over a pad, like one of these big kicking pads you may see on TV or something. And, and he he was goofing off in one of the practice rooms, and I wasn't in that practice room. I was teaching a class, and I was maybe 17 or 18 at the time, and he jumped, this kid, I think he was, the kid was nine or 10 years old, jumped over this kicking pad, 
and landed on his wrists and broke both of his wrists. Mm. Now this happens very, very, very rarely. Uh, so this is not to scare anyone away from taking martial arts. This was a freak, a freak accident. And I just remember at this young age having to make some really fast decisions. And then, you know, after the, dis- after the ambulance came and he got taken away, you know, it was kind of like that decision of like, well, what about the liability of this? And whose fault is this? And how do I protect myself? And it was really easy because I had people to call. I had, a, I had mentors in place that had already done what I knew I wanted to do, which was run a really successful karate school, really successful martial arts school. And they were just there with the answer because they knew the road ahead. They already knew what to do. They'd already been in a situation like this and they just told me what to do. And it gave me that certainty, that, that uh, certainty to move forward. So I was, I think I was blessed. I don't know if it was anything in my skin, but I was just blessed with really good uh, people, really good associations. So I think that's something that maybe we can, is easily overlooked sometimes but can provide immense value when you're trying to make decisions. Mm-hmm. At least for me, at least for me it did. Sure, absolutely. I think one of the things that I struggled with early on as an entrepreneur is feeling like I had to I had to be enough by myself and if mm. I wasn't enough by myself that maybe people would kind of sniff out that I was just faking it. And right. so I, it took me a while to get to the point where I was confident enough in what I was doing and who I was becoming and, um, and my, yes. my place in the world as an entrepreneur to really be able to not even reach out and ask for help, but just build a community of people around me that really supported me. Um, yes. so kudos to you for, you know, you were probably young enough that you weren't polluted by all the crap yet. <laughs> <laughs> Partly. Well, I had, cause see, that's another part of the associations, right? Like I had just great parents and a great family that really put me in, right. that they understood this concept. They put me in environments, but you know, I always teach my students this saying, and I, I'm actually, I'm, I'm curious if for you, if it was kind of the fake it till you make it, like I, I teach my students that uh-huh. it sounds like for you and definitely for me too, it was that, Hey, I've got to you know, I'm 15 and teaching a class of 30 or 40 yeah, people with I still am double my age. Until I make it. I don't know about you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Agreed. it's like, I'm just a better faker. I'm a totally professional. <laughs> like people would never know. And it just, things just keep working out. So I guess I'll keep doing this. Right. <laughs> right. Well, we joke, we joke about that, but I guess that's so true though, because there's always a new situation where you're like, wow, I've never been here before. What do right. I do here? You got to, you make a decision and you go with it, right? No, I was just talking to a, um, a colleague and friend of mine who um, has a trade show business up in Canada. And we were talking about how, well, he, he said for him, you know, whenever he talks to a client, he is so certain and so confident in what he's saying that, you know, they just, they're yet, they're just looking for someone who has confidence that gives them confidence that they're willing yes. to follow, you know? That's- and he's saying that, and I'm thinking, you know, that's probably true for me too. When someone comes to me and we start unpacking who they are and what their business is about and how they contribute to the world, I mean, something inside of me just sinks with it and I can just see, you know, and I talk with such passion and conviction and certainty about how this unfolds that they're nodding, yes, 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 and they end up hiring me in large <laughs> part just because I feel so sure about yes. it, you know? So yes. yeah, yeah, it's, that's a necessary entrepreneurial skill. <laughs> maybe I, I was just going to say that. I was just going to say that. You know, maybe that's something that entrepreneurs could even take away from this call. Is that, you know, it, it's the in those moments of doubt, it's it's okay to fake it, and I, and I don't mean faking it as a, you know saying something that you're not or yeah. putting forth a product that you that that, that you, you can't back up with real results. But you know, maybe the idea of hey, you're in there to try your best. If you're faking it, and, and you're trying your best. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe a good example of this I would have is when I was 15, you know, one of the ways that our academies make money is by, we will upgrade people, we'll ask them to set their goal to their black belt, which is a, a three year commitment. I mean, that's one of our, you know, that's one of our forms of income. When students set their goal to become a black belt, they sign on, they set their goal and they make this commitment. And sometimes ki- uh, parents would make this commitment in, in my school when I was only 16 years old for their three year old. Uh So they would sign their three-year-old up for a program that was as long as their kid had been alive, right? right? (laughs) And I don't say that to brag or impress. I just and and this this program, you know, would cost four to four to six thousand dollars, depending on how you choose to pay for it. And they would, I would, they people would do this simply because of my confidence, which I think 
came back from like these mentors and these people. I wasn't, I wasn't an island, right? Like I did yeah. seek out yeah. people, you know, and if I, if I'd known you at this time, like I would have loved to have you as part of my team to be able to call and say, Hey, I have, you know, I got this problem, this problem, this problem. And with how many entrepreneurs you deal with, that's even a, a great person, right? I, mm-hmm. You being on my team to have, I'm sure you've dealt with something like that before. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, but I didn't, so I had to deal with the mentors that I <laughs> did managed. have, but I had these, everything other worked out. Right, right. I got, I got you on my team now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, I had these great people in my life that I could call that, that was this environment that, that kind of supported me. Like they were this foundation that I could build on, um, for, for the confidence to be able to say, no, I want your kid to enroll. No, this is the right thing for you. And they would enroll and they mm-hmm. would start. And this blew my mind when I first started it. But then little successes build upon little successes. So, yeah, if anything to take away, when yeah. you start, you got to fake it till you make it sometimes. Yeah. So true. So totally. true. So I'd be kind of curious to hear from you. Um, I, I think like what I know about martial arts, which I keep telling myself I'm going to start training You've got to. <laughs> and I keep, that's as far as it's gotten is like, man, this really, res- that's some, some place somehow, you know, but what I, what I'm really drawn to is in martial arts is what kind of what I've been drawn to probably as a seeker and achiever is just this idea of, um, kind of learning how to actualize in a more energetic way and um, understanding how energy works and alignment. And I don't mean energy in a woo-woo sense. I mean it more in a, man, like just kind of this, this, this underlying discernment based on the conditions and the environment that you can develop over time to know what the right yes. decision is. And um, so I'd love for you just to talk a little bit about like some things that you learn in martial arts that are metaphorically really great for life. Oh, wow. Yeah, there's so many metaphors. So pick one. <laughs> oh gosh, yeah, I'll pick one. I'll, I'll tell you what, maybe I'll pick one or two. Two come to mind okay, okay. initially, real fast. But um, one is, you know, martial arts. There is no rush to greatness, and I, I tell my students this all the time. Like, I have these students that come in and they want to be good, and they want to be good fast, and they want to. Um, they want to get their black belt, you know, faster than what it normally would take. And they'll come to me and they'll talk to me about accelerating their training. And I tell them that it's okay to accelerate their training, but there's no rush. Like you have to come in and you have to put in your time and you have to train and there's no way getting around. It's going to take you a minimum of 300 hours of training minimum to earn a black belt and you can do that 300 hours in a shorter period of time if you're training more often, right? So you can increase the intensity of it. But the truth is it takes about 300 hours. Mm-hmm. And maybe the analogy for me with that in, mar- in, in business and in the entrepreneur world is just that we're always looking for – I come across so many people that it's so easy to look for the quick fix. It's so easy to look for the million-dollar idea – you know, that's going to make me a million in a week. And, and, and maybe that's, you know, and I'm not saying it hasn't happened because obviously it has happened before, but I just know too, that these ideas of overnight successes as the news yeah. talks about are really people like 10 years in the making, right? I've been 10 <laughs> or 15 or 20 years. They just been behind the scenes. Right. And then when they pop out, exactly. everyone says that overnight success. I, I, I call this the law of baby making. You don't get a love. baby in a month by getting nine women pregnant. <laughs> it's the same idea, right? Growth takes time. Yes. Yes. I, lo- <laughs> I, love, I love this analogy. <laughs> yes. It's fantastic. So I, w- I would definitely say that that is um, one analogy in martial arts. And, and maybe another quick one, I'll go on this tangent, would just be that in martial arts, you all obviously a huge part of it is about self-defense, which on a side note, Misty, I have a I have a free membership here for you. Let me decide to make the trek <laughs> from from Austin to uh, to Charlotte. Come yes. visit. We'll put you up. And you, you <laughs> now it's going to take you three hundred hours to get a black belt. Right. I'm going to. I'll pack a lunch. I'll pack a lunch. <laughs> yeah. Um, I believe everybody's got to do it. It just for the the standpoint of the discipline and the uh, of of martial arts. But another thing that you learn is being able to make decisions quickly when it comes to how to defend yourself. So. You know, if someone approaches you on the street, you're learning how to read a situation quickly, respond and address the immediate danger, 
and respond in the appropriate way, whether that's to violently counterattack, you know, is more of aggressive style or to run or to use an escape route or to whatever the strategy is that you employ. It's, but it's got to be made fast. It's got to be instinctive because on the street, if you're actually defending yourself, then if you have to stop and think about it, then you know, potentially the situation could have escalated or it could be too late. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So there's a, there's a whole process by which you just train. You train. Here's what happens and here's the reaction I'm going to take. I'm going to defend myself and then move away as fast as I can. And you just train on making decisions and you do that. And I think the analogy for in the business world is that, you know, I think that it just takes some practice. Yeah. I think that as you make little decisions, you build your confidence and you're able to make bigger ones and the little, the little ones come easy. Sure. Um, that's my, that's my thought. That's from my experience, what I've found. One of the things that, um, that strikes me about what you're saying is there's some things that I'm actualizing right now in my own business and ways I'm shifting as a person that I've, I've seen that I have a pattern and a way of handling certain situations that yes. I want to handle better. Um, and it's taking a lot of intention right now. Okay. These, these are the things that come up. This is how the pattern normally runs. It's not enough to say, I want to handle that differently next time. You know, right. I feel like I'm training, I'm going out and, you know, coming understanding, first of all, why I'm reacting the way that I am to certain situations and then coming up with what are the options? What are the other ways that this could be handled and really just studying, studying, studying that so that those options are available to me the next time I come to that crossroads. No kidding. Well, it's crazy you mention. it's crazy you say that. I was literally, right before this call, I was just going through my, my Facebook news feed and I came across somebody who posted a picture of a paragraph from a book and the book was talking about how habits are a thousand times more powerful than our desires. I, and I, ju- I literally just read this, Misty, just like two minutes ago, and it was saying how it's so easy as for us to say, oh, I want to do this or I want to be this. But then just like you said, uh, you're, you're so wise in saying that too because it's, it's the habits. It's the habitual thing or our habits that really run our lives. Mm-hmm. And those are the ways, those are the things that we have to work on. Um, Got yeah, to rewire ourselves, rewire our nervous system. So how do you think we do that? That's the real question. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm sure it's a little bit different for everyone, but I think for me, I, being cutting conscious is the first step. Mm. Because you know, then I, like, once I'm conscious of it, I know to look for it. Right. You know, so that really helps me a lot is just to become conscious, but like playing through different scenarios and how they could end. I'm doing some visualizing. Yes. Um, you know, okay, if I would have handled it this way, what could potentially have happened? Right. That way, I'm at least giving my nervous system to the extent that I can, you know, just using visualization, the opportunity to handle right. it a different way and to see a different outcome, um, which is really huge. And one of the things that I've, this is actually a really, you'll totally dig this, but um, I've been studying Alison Armstrong. Oh, I love it. Uh, yeah, I've been studying Alison Armstrong <laughs> lately, and she has this program called Celebrate Partnership. And the purpose of the program is to talk about men and women in partnership together and ways to navigate the partnership. Well, I've, I listened to it. I was thinking of my business the entire time. She talks about masculine energy as protector provider energy. When you're in your masculine energy, you're going to be accountable. And Mm -hmm. so you're coming from this protector provider space, feminine energy, um, your supporter enhancer, Mm -hmm. feminine energy is all about partnering with protector provider energy so that that person can actually deliver on whatever it is that they're responsible for. And I started thinking about my team and I think as a, because of how I was raised and, um, and also because as a woman, I've really had to prove myself so much. Yes. Um, I show up a lot of times as protector provider and supporter enhancer. Like my gut is to be supporter enhancer. Yes. You know, but I've very developed protector provider energy. Mm -hmm. I'm the oldest of three. My mom counted on me a lot growing up. And, you know, so I always had a lot of responsibility and whatever. But I just, I saw that I was doing this in my business with my team, especially where I was taking all the accountability on myself. Yes. And 
and I wasn't setting the team up to support me in being accountable to our clients. Another thing that I was doing is even though people were given certain responsibilities, I was still acting like it was my responsibility. So they weren't mm -hmm. fully empowered as protector providers over their responsibilities. Right. And not only were they not fully empowered, they also didn't fully take accountability because I was taking it. And they didn't feel like they could ask for help because they felt like they were supposed to be helping me. Hmm. So I, I went to a couple of my team members um, and I told them, okay, this is what I'm noticing that I do and this is the pattern that I have. Right. You are gonna be accountable. This is something that you're gonna have to answer for now. What do you need? How can I support you? How can the team support you? And we started shifting stuff. You know, That's awesome. a couple of key people on the team really are stepping into this and they're asking for what they need. They're shifting their own workload. They're, they're more easily leveraging stuff off instead of trying to do it all themselves because the analogy just makes so much sense. You know, oh, I get it. I'm, I'm accountable and responsible and this ecosystem is meant to support me. So it's like my intention for how we're building the business right. is right on, but just this little nuance in how I was showing up and this little nuance in how they were seeing that I was showing up and thought they had to show up was causing us not to fully leverage and collaborate so that everything got lighted for everyone. I think we are all feeling like buoyed mm -hmm. by these shifts and changes. Yes. So it's been pretty phenomenal. And I, you know, I'm like applying this to business, just it's what I right. do, I suppose. But you know, understanding how this energy stuff works and becoming aware of the options that you have available to you, I just think that's, that seems like 80% of it. <laughs> you know sure yeah and, and i love all of what you just said and i would agree with every single bit of it and i think it's important to recognize i've been in that allison armstrong world for a bit as well learning about the masculine and the, and the feminine energies and a guy who really speaks to the masculine energy is uh this guy named david, david data, data and yeah. he's he writes a book called the way of the superior man which has just changed my life and a, and a lot of the guys in my life and I would say that it's just important to recognize too that neither energy is bad. Right. It's like, it's just, they're just, I love what you just said. You said they're options that we have available to us. Because I can't tell you how many women I've met who once they learn that there's this feminine masculine, they just like, well, I don't want to be masculine. I don't want to be masculine. Right. Or they go the other way. And, just and like, it's like, no, you're missing the point. <laughs> right, right. right. <laughs> and you want to, you exactly, right. You want to say, no, you're missing the point. This is an option you have available to you so that when you, are in the business world, you can be strong. And that's how you have to be. That's probably how you've gotten, to, I'm sure you can relate to this, Misty, but that's where you've gotten to where you are. And one of my good friends put it to me this way. He, he was talking to, a, he's a coach, and he was talking to a, a young lady, and he was, he was coaching her, and he was saying, it's kind of like a suit of armor. You go, it's a certain personality, you put it on, you go into the work world, you be that protector provider, just like you said, and you have, uh -huh. to, you have to do that, and you have to delegate, and you have to be that, you, you use that option that's available to you. And then, when you come home, you know, if it's your choice, you have the option to take the suit of armor off, if right. you would like to, and be in more of a different type of an energy around your relationship, or whatever, whatever it is your choice is. But um, I don't. I think it's important to just note that neither side is bad, and, and for guys too, it's not like the feminine is bad. And that allows us to connect with people. That allows that's the, the that flow of that flow of love, that flow of energy. And I think it's important that we just recognize that those are just options, right. and we can integrate them into whatever situation we're in. Um, just like you did with your staff, I absolutely love that, and I love the accountability there. But that's kind of a, a different different. Thing. You know, I but I love it. I actually noticed in um, a business relationship uh, that I have, I've um, recently started working with a tech startup and in the beginning we were kind of in the exploratory phase and you know my colleague was coming to me with a lot of questions um, about what he should do and I've become aware of this. I am, I mean I am like Leo Lion driver get it done lead person. And my tendency sometimes is to take on things. We have a conversation and to me, it's like snap to attention and march, right. <laughs> you know? Right. And I'm really, I'm really paying attention it's to, am I, am I being asked by this person to be accountable? Because if I'm mm -hmm. not being asked to be accountable, then 
it's not time for me to step into this role, mm. you know? And the beautiful thing about that is that you make sure that you're honoring the other energy that's in your space without unintentionally taking on more. I don't think men, men struggle with this as much as women, actually. I think, and it'd be interesting to hear if you have a different perspective on that, but I think men have this innate sense of when they should take something on and when they're going to be crossing over into someone else's territory. And I don't think women all the time know and understand that because women are so much more communal and our energy is just to like, we see something needs to be done. We just help each other, you know, mm. but I've mm. noticed in my relationships with men that they can feel or react as if you're trying to compete with them, which <laughs> is like the very last, yes. like that's like not even on my radar. You know what I mean? So you can right. get yourself into these pickles if you're not really careful. But anyway, this whole idea of just asking myself, in my dialogue with colleagues, are they asking me to be accountable or are they asking for support? It really changed the nature of our conversations. And I think I was able to show up in a way um, that that was perceived as really supportive, but I don't, I don't, I'm not, I don't quit being a leader just because right. I'm taking a supportive position. You know, I'm still, I still have the same, you know, great ideas, hopefully they're great. Um, I still have the same confidence and certainty, you know, I'm the same person. I'm just not shifting my energy so that I'm taking on stuff that I shouldn't be taking on. So right. I just, this is like for me in my world, a revolutionary distinction. And I love being able to call it protector provider accountable versus supporter enhancer, because right. then you're not labeling it, you know, male or female, masculine, feminine. Mm. you're not getting caught in the polarity of that as much as just kind of seeing it as a useful framework to evaluate the best way for you to show up. Right. So, oh, I love it. Yeah. I, lo I love the distinction between male and female and just naming it what it actually is. That's right. great because there's a lot of connotations and that go along with that. And that probably attributes a lot to people thinking negative or positively of it. Right. But I just, I think another huge takeaway only to add on to what everything you just said is that you did something that unfortunately I feel like is really uncommon with entrepreneurs sometimes, at least in my experience, and that is that you had the courage, uh, the courage and set aside the ego to go to somebody on your team and say, I need accountability, I want help, I want you to hold me accountable when I go into this path. That's so huge. And maybe that's even a, just a huge takeaway of, okay, we know, we all know, everybody knows, right? Like what's the secret to a great relationship? communication right <laughs> yet we forget that sometimes with our team members I mean I, I do and I have maybe eight team members that report to me directly and it's um you know sometimes I, I'm in a pattern I'm working with someone right now where I'm in a pattern of getting frustrated and angry and it's like man I gotta break that pattern sometimes and just go ha sit down and say okay here's what I'm feeling how can you help me with this so we can get on the same page and accomplish our outcomes so I, but that takes courage right that takes yeah. like a setting aside and and maybe this is the 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 ego coming into play but to put set aside everything else and say hey i need your help or hey i want i want your accountability for this is huge i yeah. commend you for that i know that 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 takes courage yeah thank you and i also think you kind of get to a point where it's like you just get sick of yourself you know right it's like <laughs> it I'm just quits being a good excuse and <laughs> like right. yeah there's some there's some areas in my life which you know i'm so like okay with my humanity um but there's some areas of my life where i'm like i am so sick of being stuck in this place and frustrating everybody else. You know, yes. like at some point I feel like I'm gonna lose rapport if I don't, if I don't like right. own my shit and. <laughs> I love it, I love it. And Move you through. said, you said, well, you said something earlier that really caught my attention. You said you visualize what will be the positive result if yeah. you act in a different way. Is that what you said earlier? Yeah. Or like one of these, well, you know, on the flip side, I would recommend, and I do this all the time, I probably do this, I, I, I visualize what will happen if I don't change. Yes. Like I feel, visualize, man, if I keep going down this ter down this path, uh, just like you said, I'm gonna lose rapport, I'm gonna lose this person, you know what? And all of that pain that I think about in the future gets me to take action, it yeah. gets me to go, okay, ego aside, I'm sitting down, I'm communicating, ego aside, you know, and this works in personal relationships too. It's like our ego aside, I'm, uh -huh. I'm talking to my girlfriend about this. We're right. going to make this happen. So visualizing can work the other way too. Of I don't want that pain. If you visualize a year into the future or five years into the future of what will happen if you don't change, 
oh, that, that gets painful pretty fast for me, especially if I'm in a pattern that is even a little bit destructive. But when yeah. I think a couple of years into the future, it becomes ult- it becomes yeah, even that much more destructive. Yeah. It totally intensifies. Have you done so, Date with Destiny? I have done Date with Destiny twice, and it has rocked my world. So I, I haven't <laughs> done Date with Destiny yet. I'm hoping that I'll, I'll be able to do it in December oh, yes. um, if yes. the moons continue to align cool. as they are. But, um, but I've talked to several people about the values work that you do. So yes. I started working with one of the master trainers in Tony's community, Yes. around my values and one of the things for those of you that aren't familiar with date with destiny actually sam you should probably give this little commercial about date with go, destiny go but it's one it. it's tony's tony's favorite event tony robbins it's his favorite event his signature event it's i don't know is it a week or 10 days nine days or something yeah seven days seven days seven days and um and you really go deep sam you give the plug you're more qualified. I mean, it's full It's full out. I mean, when you say seven days, it might as well be 10 because you're up early and I mean early 7, 8 a.m. and you're there till 1 or 2 a.m. the next morning. And people, when I tell people that, they think I'm crazy. They're like, I could never do that. But you are, you are so into developing yourself for those seven days that, you know, never before do we take seven days and just focus on like, how can I be a better person? Mm-hmm. And you're right. When I, to, to pick up where you left off on values, one of the main things from that event is he has you go through and look at your life and say, okay, up to this point in my life, what have I valued? And not just what do I say I value, because we all would say I value love and connection and giving and all those things, but not just what we say we value, but what have you valued? And he uses this word operationally. Like if you look at your actions, what have you valued? Mm-hmm. You know, and if you and, and so if you say you value your intimate relationship, yet you've spent an hour in the last month on working on that, then operationally you don't value your inter- intimate relationship. It, it, it's kind of where he's going with that, and obviously there's individual situations which may not make that apply. But so he's saying operationally, you write those things down, and then he go, takes you through a process where you rework, and he asks you this question of, what do I need to value? to reach my ultimate destiny. Like with where I'm going, what do I need to value? And then he has the process called integration. So once you write all those things out, he integrates it. And this is Tony Robbins' ultimate skill set is the human psychology of knowing how your brain works and how to get something in there in your brain uh, subconsciously so that you begin to form habits around it. And that's the biggest thing for me. So I'll get a little, little personal story. I went into date with destiny this last December. And on a side note, I have decided that I will go every year from now on. It's just, it's, 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 it's a must for me, but, uh, I valued certainty and I valued significance operationally the most going into date with destiny in December. And when I came out, I realized that those things were going to hurt me in the long run and that I needed to value other things. And the two things that I wanted to value were contribution, giving back to the people in my life and my staff and my team and my students from my schools and love. And if I can put those two at the top, oh my gosh, those are worlds apart. So he made a cool switch for me and I'm a, I'm a huge fan and I could talk about it for hours. I know, I, I'm right? A huge fan. Well, I was yeah. really fascinated by this idea of moving toward values and moving yes. away values. Like, what do you what do you find yourself moving toward? What do you find yourself moving away from? And I actually went through myself and, you know, just kind of profiled, okay, what are my top moving toward values? What am I moving away values? And I, I saw some value conflicts, some places mm. where um, the things that I say I want, I wasn't going to be able to achieve and accomplish because it conflicted with another value that clearly was more important to me. Um, mm. And it very illuminating. Like I'm really conscious of some areas that I need to make, make shift for me right now. And I, that's, this is one of the things that I love about being a business owner. I feel like it's like this fertile ground for just like personal growth, (laughs) you know, and actualizing, which incidentally my number, my number one value is growth. Um, the guy that I was working with was like, give me a word that's really emotive. So we, we blossoming and blooming is what we came up with. But, um, But that's like the number one value for me. And I can see across the board in my life where I always choose growth over pretty much anything else, you know, um, including including relationships. And that doesn't just mean romantic relationships. That just means people come into my life. And if, you know, there's if we come across a 
you know, some kind of crossroads and, um, and I feel like I have to compromise growth in some way to continue in alignment with them, I will, I will let the relationship go. Mm. Um, and I've even seen it in family relationships where there's just certain ways that I know that I can't align with my family because it becomes a block for me. Right. You know, so right. I'm, I make those shifts a lot easier than someone that maybe doesn't have growth is like their number one value, you know? Yes. So it's yes. just, it's very fascinating to see how you're wired and to use that as, you know, kind of a mirror to help you see what you can do differently and how you can shift and grow. And, you know, certainly from an entrepreneurial perspective, that's, you know, a very important part of being successful in the space. So absolutely. I love it. I love that you're into all that stuff too. Um, my favorite entrepreneurial friends kind of dabble in the Tony Robbins community. N nothing yeah. against all my <laughs> entrepreneurial friends that don't. <laughs> I love you too. <laughs> but there's something special about those experiences. Um, and the just keen awareness that you get on your own, your own life. Um, that is just really meaningful to me. So, Amen. um, so let's, let's kind of like wind it down here. I want you to get a little plug in about salsa dancing. No. Because when I talk to you and Joe <laughs> about salsa dancing, first of all, your passion and zeal for taking up salsa is just crazy. But what is what's the big deal? <laughs> <laughs> well, you tell know, me. Oh, no, you, you you got to. Um, oh goodness, there's so many things I could say about this. It's like where to start. But you know, I'm glad we met through this mutual friend, Joe, because Joe watched me dance at a uh, at a place called Mangoes after a Tony Robbins event. Yeah, uh -huh. coincidentally. Right. And uh, he, he, he comes to me and he goes, I want to learn to dance. And I hear people say that all the time. So I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah that's fine. But Joe really took off and, and has it. developed a passion for it. Yes. And I, I hope he's, I hope he's giving you a lesson. You guys are in the same he's, town. He's so he, harassing me. About has he? Okay. Dancing. Yes. <laughs> I will ensure that he does this more until you <laughs> Yes, until five, I so. succumb. <laughs> Misty, I'm making a list here. There's a lot of things you need to do, Marshall. <laughs> oh, I know, I know. <laughs> I'm Charlotte. making a list too. Jeez. <laughs> bucket list items. Bucket yeah. list items for sure. Salsa dancing. I mean, we've covered so many things in this in this call from business to money to personal development to psychology. And I, I just maybe maybe salsa dancing is an appropriate way to kind of wrap it up because it all boils down as an entrepreneur. At some time or another, we are dealing with another human being. I mean, we just are always dealing with human beings, um, whether it's in our personal relationships or our professional relationships. And dancing is an amazing way. It's an amazing analogy for any kind of a relationship. And I, so I'll, get, I'll, I'll just tell you this little story about how it works for me and my friends. We laugh about this and talk about this. But, you know, when you go up to a, a lady you know, as a, as a young man, I go up to a lady on the dance floor and you extend your hand and you, you ask to dance. And when, when you get, it's like you're beginning a mini relationship. So you provide, you know, you provide the frame. Mm -hmm. It kind of goes back to that protecting, supporting or protecting, providing rule that you mentioned earlier. But you, you know, the guy provides the frame and the girl gets, is the one that looks beautiful, right? She gets, but then there's this whole dynamic of like who leads, and then it's like sometimes the guy will lead, but then sometimes the girl will not let the guy lead. And sometimes the guy will end up becoming, there can be this fight or there can be where well, one person leads really too strong and, you know, the, the, the dance doesn't look well, it doesn't look good, but the best dances always happen. This is across the board with any dance when there is rapport uh, between the two people, when there's um, you know, a rapport of, uh, maybe it was a rapport that was established before the dance, but when you get those dances that you create something beautiful on the dance floor. And I think the analogy for entrepreneurs and the analogy for business people is we can create, we're not lone islands. You were the one that told me this, Misty. I've used it like two or three times in this call now, but you, you told me when we first talked on the phone, like, man, so many entrepreneurs feel like they're just, they're, they're islands and they're not. There's people, there's people like you, there's people like me, there's people, there's people that can help them, that can support them. And dancing is a great analogy for that is that, and that is this, when we are in rapport with the people on our team, with the people on, when we're communicating well with the people in our family or our intimate relationship and things, we can create amazing things. Mm -hmm. And that's what creates an amazing dance for me. So Maybe that's a little out there for everybody. I'm a dance fanatic, but I uh, I think it's a beautiful analogy for what can be done 
um, uh, with a, with when two people are in alignment, right? right? Where two people are willing to kind of give and go and not that everything's perfect. Cause even in a dance you make mistakes, but your one person kind of covers for the other person and you laugh it off when you do make mistakes, you know, but the dances that just completely suck are when one person is so worried about being perfect and they want to look really good and the other person doesn't care or one person's trying to lead and they both want to lead and there's, a, there's you know, they're butting heads. And so it's about rapport. It's about the communication. It's about the, uh, the relationship that you have there, even on the dance floor, even if it's for five minutes. Right. So, um, I'm a, I'm a huge fan and I, I love this show. Uh, what's the, the show dancing, dancing with the stars with actually. Stars. Oh, yes. Derek, Derek Hoff. Is that the big guy? Uh-huh. Who, the blonde, the blonde. He yeah. Winning the, the mirror ball. Yes. <laughs> yes. He's awesome. Well, believe it or not, he was at my last date with destiny. So I got to, oh, I think I didn't get to really chat with him much, but, uh, it was just a cool, it was just, that was a kind of a cool little, a little thing as well. I'm a, I'm a huge fan. Yeah. Well, if I make it to date with Destiny in December, we're going to have to go salsa dancing. <laughs> Done. I'll be there. I'll be, <laughs> I'm writing it down. New I goal. will have to get, I will have to get <laughs> lessons before so that I can keep up with you on the dance floor. But yeah, right. that would be totally fun. Well, isn't that, isn't that so interesting though that you say that? Because I think that's how some people think about business. They're like, oh, I need to. But, you, you know, it just takes that courage sometimes to jump in there uh-huh. and just to do it and to be like, you know what, I'm going to make mistakes, but you're going to have fun. It's right. going to be a blast. And I know that um, that's the mindset I take when I look, think about my business is like someone told me the other day, they said, business is an adventure. And I was like, you bet it is. It's like, <laughs> it is. It's like, the, it's like that game people play on their phones, Temple Run. I don't know if you've ever played that game. It's a video game, but it's pretty popular these days. It's like always something new coming at you, a tree, a rock, a whatever right. it is. Well, you've, uh, you've, you've already got a lifetime of business under your belt by the time I just got started. So <laughs> you're, you're going to have more lives than all of us. It's going to be exciting to mm. see your future unfold and all the great things that you do. And I'm mm. so excited that you joined us Thank you. today for this great conversation. Why don't you tell everyone where they can find you if they want to connect with you online or zip you an email or heck if they're in your neighborhood and want to come and take lessons or, you know, sign up for martial arts. How can they get a hold of you? Come, come train. All I got to say is come stop by Charlotte and jump in a class. If you're in the Charlotte or Charlotte, North Carolina area or the Charlottesville, Virginia area, the best thing to do is just type my name into Google. It's uh, Sam Wiegert and the last name is W E G E R T. And my blog will pop up first. And that has all my contact information, my number, my email and, yeah, interested in any way they can find out more about me and my work and my and my team's work and Super Kicks is the name of my my company Super Kicks Karate and we have multiple locations right now in Virginia and North Carolina so it's an honor to to be on this call and to um and if I could just say one more thing Misty before sure. we 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 go and that would be I jotted this down I got some sticky notes here in front of me and, and the last thing I would say is just coaching you you we talked about rewiring your brain and you know how do you change habits and I just, um, I can't say enough, and I know you didn't ask me to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway, and that is, I can't say enough how awesome it is to hear about what you do, which, you know, there are not enough people out there trying to help entrepreneurs. There are not enough people out there trying to coach them and guide them and giving them direction. So I'm a huge fan of your work, and I just wish you all the success in the world, and if there's ever anything I could do to help you, um, I'm a, a text or a phone call away, but... I think everybody's got to have coaching. Everybody's got to have someone that can look from the outside because it's a different perspective. We're so caught up in our own head sometimes. We just don't see it. But just talking with you, it's like you can help me see things that I just don't see because I'm in it. Right. I'm just too close. So I, um, I'm a huge fan of that, and I'm just honored to be on this call. So thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you, Sam. I totally loved this conversation. I wasn't expecting all of these great gems. It's going to be really fun to uh, – to kind of go back and put together the show notes for this one because we man, we covered a lot of ground. This was awesome. Thank you My for pleasure. sharing with us today and um, love that you're a part of the creative entrepreneur community and everybody check out the show notes, get in touch with Sam. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of Creative Entrepreneur Radio. Have a good one. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Creative Entrepreneur Radio. If you've enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review on iTunes. That helps others find our show. You can find links, contact information, and a recap of today's episode in the show notes found at creativeentrepreneurradio.com. 
tweet Tell Misty. That's T E L L M I S T Y with your thoughts, ideas, or questions, and join the conversation on our Facebook group. You can learn more about Misty and her work over at markatechu.com. See you next time.